Hey everybody, Jason Carter here. I'm with Justin Spring. He's the director of records of Boone and Crockett, as well as David Harrell. He's uh, the Shed Tours guy, right next to our booth. We're basically sharing a booth and has probably what I consider to be the world's premier, number one collection of mule deer sheds. And so today we've got a shed here. I'm gonna let uh, David tell you a little bit about this shed. Um, obviously, mule deer have incredible animals, this one especially, which does present a scoring issue for most people. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today on how to score a shed that's got this kind of palmation. Where do you start the points? Where do they start and end? Tell us a little bit about this particular shed. Well, this particular shed come out of uh, Central Saskatchewan. And one of the questions is, as an antler collector, I get a lot, especially when you have palmation webbing, points busting out of other points, people will have, everybody has their own opinion. I've had official measure measure several of my sheds and come up with different scores. So I was on the phone one day getting some of my records changed with Justin and he said, you know what, I'll be at the, the expo, how about I stop by with my wife and we'll measure the horns. So what I've asked Justin to do is he's actually gonna tape the antler and show where so, which is the, the, G, the G2, G3, the, the G4, the main beam. He'll show where the, where the extra points kind of come down and, we'll, and, and intersect some of those, those points and, and we'll take proper mass measurements, you know, because on this particular set, we will find out which one he declares is the G3. That'll determine where he takes the mass measurement on this shed. We'll see what type of score he comes up with. And then we have another shed here. This particular shed's out of Kansas. It's a crazy shed. It's got super palmation, super webbing, points coming off of other points, points that come all the way back. Very tough to kind of even tell maybe where a G2 is on that one. Some people I've had Multiple Boone and Crockett measures show me which th what they thought were their G2s. Most of them have always been different. Otherwise, I think you know his G3s, G2s, his main beams pretty consistent. But Justin's going to tape this buck. Score, him and his wife are going to score bull sheds, and then we'll post the scores and show the tape lines and how they do at the end, and that'll give us an idea how Boone and Crockett scores webbing and palmation. All right. So. Uh the biggest thing with Boone and Crockett system is, is our system looks at the typical mule deer frame, typical whitetail frame, whatever the category is. We've kind of de defined what this typical mature animal is going to look like. So anytime you get anything crazy like this, the first thing we do is just look back and say, where is the typical frame in this antler? And you've got, you've got some stuff to the inside here, but I mean, if we look at this, and this never happened, clearly this tine's coming up, mule deer will commonly flare out, you know, so we're gonna say this is our G2, our back tine there. Pretty clearly, this is just a normal fork to the front, so this is gonna be our three. This leaves all this in here as abnormal growth. Coming up to here, you've actually got two options here on what your G4 would be. Now on a shed, it's not as important, but on the other side, you know, if this deer matched on both sides, either one of these as a standalone point would clearly qualify as your G4. This is the only situation if you have two identical points that both qualify, don't fall, you know, don't violate any rules. You actually get to pick which one of these is going to help so your you animal would match the, best. the other side. If this point didn't exist, right, you would use this one or vice versa. Right, and, and so if the other so side, you get the net, you get a better net. Right, and so if the other side looked just like this, we'd see which one of these two had the most deductions and use the other to help out the deer the most, since neither of these points violate any rules that we have of a G3. I think one thing when you talked about the G2, G3. That you know, in large part, take, uh, determines where you're going to take that mass. Yeah. And there's a lot of guys that are just going to, you know, of course, out in the field, they're going to want to take the biggest mass no matter right. what. That's not necessarily the case. Your G2, G3, and your split off the beam will dictate where you take that mass. Well, and one thing I always, me as a as a mule deer enthusiast, I love big frames. So I would always go with this with a four versus that with a four right. because. The, the typical frame with this with a four, I mean, now we're ta now we, we would probably be talking a 78 inch to an 80 inch antler. This with a, being the four, now we're gonna up really above. beef up the antler. So now That's instead right. of, say, a typical buck being a 185 inch typical frame, now we're blowing him out to a 195 inch uh, typical frame and then add the but trash. But at the end of the day, gross is gross. Gross no matter is which gross way no you matter which it. way you go. And that would be better. So, It'd be better if you netted him possibly, right. depending on what the other side looks like using the smaller point, which is naturally what you don't want to do. Exactly. Right. But, right. but it may be better for the deer. Yes. So the first thing we'll do is we'll, you know, we've, we, like I said, we've identified this tine as our G2. It's coming up, the, the main growth's coming up to here. We're gonna say that this entire projection here is gonna be our two. We'll terminate it out here. This probably is not gonna qualify. We'll double check it. But uh, 
Anyway, when we're doing this, we need a baseline where it comes off the beam and we need a baseline to say where this tine would be had this three never happened. So, first thing we'll do is we'll put this down here, kind of where it would be. Now, a lot of people, you know, we do see some mistakes here. When we're putting our baseline on, on these twos, we're trying to mimic where this beam would have naturally grown had this whole projection never happened. So it's not going to be a straight line. You know, that beam would not have come up here and then shot across. What we're going to use is this underside of this beam, and we're basically going to parallel that, saying naturally that's, that's how that beam would look, okay? So... All right, so then we step back and we look. We're not too high, we're not too low. That beam would have come right through there had this whole projection never happened. So we're good here on our baseline. Okay, we're gonna do the same thing here as we did down here on the base. Where would this G2 tine have naturally been? And this one is gonna be a little bit of a judgment call. You've got a real wide point. It's a pretty hard argument to say that this tine would shoot out real quick like that. It's gonna be a more gradual um, deal. Something, something more like that is where I'm gonna say that this, this baseline would have naturally been. Okay. So, going from there, we've identified G2, G3, this is abnormality. We are saying this is growing inside, off the inside of your G2, G3 point. So we always want to measure everything just one time for Boone and Crockett. If we were to cut these off right at the top of the palmation, you're not going to be including any of this. But if we bring them both down, you're basically double including this. So what we're going to do here is look at these two points. And I'm going to say this is the more dominant tine. I would, I can argue that this is going to come all the way down to this too. So, basically, if we're saying this comes all the way down there, we need to extend that baseline that we started up here on the two down into here. Make sure we're lining up on that line we started with. Take a look again. That's going to be kind of that natural flare of that. So if you could mark. All right. So now we've got a baseline there. Now for this one, this base is coming down. This base is coming down. So we're actually going to take this cable. And this is gonna be looped in here because these tines would not be square again. There'd be a natural curvature of these tines. I forgot to tape it. So we're giving credit for all this material down into here on this tine, but this one we don't wanna short. So we're gonna drop this down in there to naturally where these two tines would have been had this not happened. So what does that look good to you on that side? All right, so now we've determined this tine is going to come all the way down into here. This tine we're going to terminate into there. You got your two, your three. All this material should be measured one time, so it's all going to get the credit for what it grew on that. This is pretty straightforward, similar to on the other times. That's where that beam would be. Now this one's a little difficult. Um, you see how this whole thing's kind of bladed up? You know, again, that time wouldn't have done this. I mean, 
we're going to come all the way back into here when we assign where this point is, because that's how that beam naturally would have been. This one, I mean, you could only come down to there. That is not going to be an inch either. So neither one of these two projections are going to qualify as an inch, so they will not be points. The last thing we're going to do here is the G1. Any time for Boone and Crockett, you take the greatest outside curve. On a G1, commonly they'll go forward or they'll go back. Uh, this one's pretty clear. This is going to be the outside, but very commonly on a one, you're going to have to you're going to have to put tape on both sides. It has to be on the front or the back, but you have to stay right in the middle on the outside curve. And this could be so close, you need to measure both sides to give the deer the most credit for whichever one is longer. I mean, that's that's one of the, the biggest differences I hear. A lot of a lot of old school measures, I think your old Boone and Crockett measures, always said you had to to be on your outside edge certain ways. And now I've I've seen you can you you're saying you can be on both. You find the furthest, the longest the point, outside, the great the greatest outside spread. Where it used to be, some measures, it didn't matter what they turned the shed around and it had to be, you know, a certain way. So if if if, if this shed where this eye guard hooked forward, even though it might have hooked backwards, they would have still done it off this backside, which you lose because this, of the hook over. So it's, it's glad to clarify that part of and it. And there is a couple categories, antelope, for example, on a prong length. Yeah. Those it actually says in our manual, it must be the outside. Right. So even if a prong came out or in, we still do have to be right. outside there. But on a deer, it just says greatest outside curve, yeah. which could be either side of the projection. That's super to know. And we're doing the same thing here. Where, where would this beam have been had this time not happened? Commonly guys come down too low, that, you know, too high, too low, that's not correct. We're trying, to, we're trying to match up this side to where this would have been had that time not ever happened. It actually kind of falls right on that, which is gonna make it a little bit challenging. Whenever you start a main beam link, we've got these cables. This is just a, originally we were using old compound bow cables. Um, but basically what you do, you hook this right on the under lip of this burr. Now you don't come way down in or anything, but you just hook that right there. We're gonna stay in the center. So she's gonna tape that uh, cable on as she goes up so we can make sure that we didn't get pulled too low or too high as we work our way up this beam. And remember up here, we identified, we identified this line as the base of this too. So that means this is the top of our beam, this is the bottom. We're gonna keep this cable right in the center by the time we get up to that point. Same thing when we get out to here, you got the top, the bottom. Does that look good? Good view. got a projection right in the middle and what BNC rules say is you take the shortest distance around it so we're gonna actually just kind of eyeball it out here we'll take it like that once try the other way so that's actually gonna be shorter so we're gonna end up using that side Sixteen, even. Sixteen, zero. Mm -hmm. 
the same. Good there. Eleven even. Nine and seven. On the circumferences, basically it says right on the B and C score chart, this is a shed hunter's uh, chart, but uh, between Burr and G1, she's just gonna look for the smallest spot here, so just work it up and down. Five and two. Six. On the circumferences, basically it says right on the B and C score chart, this is a shed hunter's uh, chart, but uh, between Burr and G1, she's just gonna look for the smallest spot here, so just work it up and down. Four and six. So this next one's going to be a little bit challenging. The rules say between the beam and the G3. So the question is, if you take a circumference up here, I would almost say that, that you can't take it underneath. So you're actually taking it over the three, which I don't think is correct. Um, beams here, threes there, you have to take the narrowest. I think the correct place to take this is gonna be right here. And that's just because if we try to go above, it actually pulls us up over the tine, which is not correct according to how the rules are written. So I'm going to make a call on this. This will be reviewed by the shed hunters as well. We'll actually measure both spots here, and that'll be a comment that I send to them saying, hey, you know, here's the call I made. You know, I don't know how you guys deal with this on sheds, but this is what I was comfortable with. But here's the other option if you don't like that one. And that's going to be right at eight on the nose. Like I said, I mean, this is going to be smaller, but I don't really feel this is between my beam and three. So I don't think this is going to be a valid measurement, but it comes in at six and three. So I'm going to put a note over here. Then our last one's going to be... Uh, Right there is the only place we can take it. I'm going to hit right on the 16th, so we're going to take that up to 6 and 6. So I had her check my math. It's actually 109.2. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about inside spread. Um, for Boone and Crockett, it's pretty simple to do it. It has to be taken on the main beams. We do see that mistake sometimes. Obviously, up here is going to be a wider inside spread, but this is not main beam. This is the main beam. So what we do is we take a sliding ruler like this, and we're just purely trying to find widest point between these beams it is basically perpendicular so the axis of the skull you hear us talk about this this is the axis of the skull the angle the inside must be taken perpendicular to that so basically at the same angle across the bird so you got to be perpendicular to the axis then we're just going to be finding the widest place from the center of the beam to the center of the beam so if these 
if these are real bladed and flared in or out, it doesn't matter. It's always the exact center of the beam to center of the beam, widest place between beams. This one's got quite a bit of unique webbing and, and whatnot going on. So as I go through, we're kind of explain what we're doing and what we're assigning uh, points and why, and uh, start in on it. First thing again we gotta do, we always are looking for that typical four point or five point frame on a mule deer. Um, you know, you could have a lot of questions, a lot of potential G2s up here, but if we look at how this deer grew from the inside, I'm gonna say that the, that the main G2 growth came right up to here. All this stuff out here is all gonna be abnormal growth off of our G2 point. This is gonna be abnormal growth as well. You got a beam tip here. This is gonna be our G4. When assigning a G3, it must come off the front edge of the G2. You can't have a tine coming off the side, so these, none of these could be our three. This one, the center of it hits this G2 before we hit the main beam. So this can be a G3. If this came down into the crotch or lower, this would not qualify. But since the base of this tine, the center of it hits this G2 prior to hitting the main beam, I'm gonna say this is our G2, this is our G3. So we'll go ahead and put the baselines on the outside with that in consideration. So what we're doing here is we're assigning where, where this beam would have grown had this tine never happened. So this is just a piece of tape, so I'm not writing on the antler. But I'm gonna use this cable and I'm gonna try to copy the bottom edge of this because this is the bottom of our beam down here. Obviously, if a beam's growing, it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be pretty much, the line on the bottom would be parallel to the top edge had these tines not happened. So that's my consideration. Now this three, it's gonna look, it's gonna look a little further out when we put this on, but this is the edge of the two. So that baseline's gonna be in here. We'll credit all this stuff. We'll look at that when we put the baselines on these tines up here. We're gonna put this on both edges on our two. Others. Oh, uh, that's right. Okay. You want to put the three on there since we're here? Or the four, excuse me. So what I'm looking at here, we've got to assign one of these as the main point and one of them is going to be a point off of a point. So I'm just kind of looking at where the antler growth goes. To me, this looks like the point was growing this way. This is going to be an abnormal that grew off of there. So we're going to put our baseline on here. And again, where would, where would this tine have grown had this not happened? So we've got quite a bit of swelling there that I don't, that I think is part of this point, not of that. So we're actually gonna pull that down into there. So let's first identify where this two would have been. down a little lower on this one.
I like that. We've had some material broken here. We don't know what that is, but from what's left, what we can measure here, we're gonna say this tine comes all the way down to this baseline. This is coming off that tine. Okay, so we've got a tine here. Tie in there. We've got nothing here to measure, so this obviously you know is not really going to be added in. Um, so here, what we want to do, we're going to have to assign what of this palmation is part of this, and what of this down here is going to be part of this G2 again. We're doing our outside curve, so that's why we're doing this on the outside. This is all the outside curve of these tines. Put a whole line under there. I'm gonna hold that up here. Yep. Hold on. Yeah, right there. Bring it on down. So what I'm doing, I'm saying this is where this G2 point would have grown had none of this happened. Okay, so we're saying all this growth out here was part of this. If none of this would have ever have, have taken place, the G2 would have come up about like that. And then so what I did is just assigned where that tine would have grown to come up here and terminate there. <clears throat> So this line is saying this would all would all have been here had none of this happened. So then as we take these tines to recognize all this, then we're working this whole mass is what we're working on now. So this tine is going to come all the way down to that baseline standalone. There's separation there. Then we've got to look at this. I'm going to say this will probably measure this all the way. I'll we'll have to look at that a little bit, but. One of these two we're going to say is our main tine that'll come down to here, and the other one will be a tine off of a tine. So this is broken, that might be throwing off our opinion, but from what I can see here, it's kind of six, one half dozen the other, but you can't take them both all the way down because you'd be double measuring this. It's very uncommon to have two tines on top of each other coming back. It's almost like we're double measuring this. But if you feel this, there's, there's separation on both sides coming all the way down and I mean right there you can feel there's an indentation there and there and it comes all the way out this point so it's almost I almost think we're going to be pulling this way down in there which is very uncommon that generally we'd see that and be like that's a mistake but you know feel it, feeling this this and the feeling where the veining is isn't it? right and it's not really it's the veining can throw you off because it all of it has to have veins to get the blood to it to grow it's the, it's the main tine separation. It's this differentiation right here that you may not even be able to so see on the camera. For it going back to your G2 or your where, where does this become one point? Gotcha. And I don't That's feel right. it. It's where you sync up to the other side too. And I don't feel it becoming one point until we get all the way back all the way into down. here, which is very interesting. Again, like I said, not not a common situation. And yeah. can I hold so you can? I don't know. I, yeah, I know. Right? I think we're gonna take it. Hold it right there, Becca. Just hold it, hold it. I can't come that low because the separation doesn't come that far down. It comes down to about here. So since we don't have it all the way down, we are going to put a baseline.
I'd say that's right at the termination, the separation, wouldn't you? The G1, and I think we're taped. Both sides will try both ways. Definitely going to be that outside, so I'm going to do that and I can record. Definitely going to be this side? Yeah. Main, main beam first, yeah. So, again, on this one, we've got some abnormalities that'll be right where our beam link's going to be taken. So, we're going to try, I'm guessing we're just going to come right over the top of it. But again, you know, you go the shortest distance around this. So, if it's longer to come around here, no, that artificially inflate your score. But, but pulling it slightly off center to come around this is the correct policy of dealing with an abnormal coming out of the side of a beam. Again, we're going to hook it right. Find the exact, we're looking for the exact center of the antler here, okay? This so is, This is to do your main beam. Yep, correct. And that, just, that's probably the biggest disagreements I get with other shed collectors and people is where does the main beam focus, you know, the center of the eye or whatever, the, the deep, some well, guys, sometimes you'll have a pizza like mm -hmm. over, guys will think they can, you know. You know, over. and in the event that you do have a chunk sticking down in the center, what I always say, read what the rule says, it says the center of the antler. I don't have the authority to say, well, we're not going to use the center because there's something sticking off. The rule says the center, we're going to take it in the center. Take it in the center. You know, and this one, I mean, it just happens to be right right in there. Right, so pretty. Right where about it is the right. furthest down. Right about there. You like that? Yep. Three and one. Your two, we're going to come from the center here. We've got a baseline here, so just keep it in the center going all the way up. Yep. Put, put one down short. There you go. Perfect. here.
Okay. G4. G4 is 8 and 1. 8 and 1 8. That's the center. This one's going to come right down here. We're going to say that's the center because that's all broken. So I'm bringing that down there. Right. Two and four. We're taking him down to here. Take him all the way right back to here. <laughs> and this is coming all the way down under there. Taking this one? No, this. Oh. Again, eleven and four. Yeah, I know it was like the same. Six and five. circumferences and that should do her again so you know on our score chart it says the smallest place between the burr and g1 for your h1 circumference so i'm just checking where my smallest it's going to be right there which is going to be five and two that's five and Five and six. No, you can't go above it. That's the three. What did they say? Five and six. That's five seven. One thirty four and three. We agree. <laughs> Cranked out the shed. Would we end up with score wise? One thirty four and three. One thirty four and three eighths. What a freaking monster! But a lot of that comes, as you talked about, David, you know, there's a lot of judgment calls. On a deer like this, I killed a deer, not quite like this mass, but very similar, down on Arizona. And uh, a couple different scores could get a couple of different, uh, Absolutely. you know, scores. You, you've scored a lot of bucks, David. Yeah. And what did you come up with? I had 131 and some change, and I've had it scored by a couple other guys that were official measures. And it was scored as low as 125 and higher than what Justin just scored it. So, so what do you say? 134 incher yeah. times two is what? It's 268 plus inside, plus inside spread. We're talking, we're talking 280 plus field yeah, we're knocking on the door of something really big. So anyway, um, Justin here kind of went through it, just kind of gave it, I don't know, I guess it's semi-official, huh? It is official. Oh, that is that, that, that official shed. You stand by it? Yes. Uh -huh. All right. So <laughs> anyway, uh, appreciate Justin with Boone and Crockett here. Boone and Crockett's just a phenomenal organization. Of course, uh, we talk Boone and Crockett scores because it's something we all know. It's what every hunter, what every hunter, shed hunter, big game hunter, Boone, it, Boone and Crockett gets brought up somewhere in the conversation. Yeah. So anyway, just appreciate you guys and your time, showing Thanks us how to showing us how to score giant mule deer, of course, which is about the only thing that matters. So. <laughs>
<laughs> anyway. The crocodile All right. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you guys. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Much. Thank you, Justin. Just look it up. It's going to be number three. Number three? Number three. Thank you very much. In the world, number three. Number three, really shy. single. Yeah. Okay. okay. Tell us about the shed book a little bit. Just tell us a little bit about it. so people that don't know that there's a. Well, the shed book's mostly run by uh, a, a group of guys that live in Kansas. Uh, there's a group of guys that kind of run it. Mule deer haven't really taken over. They, you know, there's not a lot of enthusiasm out west to enter their sheds into into the shed hunters book. Hopefully that'll start to grow. A lot of it's whitetail, a lot of interest in whitetail. Um, but I think the more that the publicity they get out there and do stuff like this, okay. I think there's going to be an opportunity for mule deer shed enthusiasts to get their sheds grow. I'm going to personally call it the David Harrow book <laughs> because yeah. the David Harrow shed antler collection probably takes the top 99 of the top 100 sheds found in the last 20 years. All right. Appreciate you, buddy. Thank you.